Well, I'd like to start uh, with a little more discussion of Derrida before we turn to Deman. Uh, and uh, I know already that I'm going to forego what for me is a kind of pleasure, uh, perhaps wouldn't be for you, uh, which is an explication which, which is an explication of the last extraordinary sentence in Derrida's essay on page 926 in the right-hand column. I'm going to read it to you um, just so you can reflect on it. And what I'd like to do is suggest to you that if you still haven't determined on a paper topic, you might very well consider this one. I, you may not find it congenial, but supposing that you are intrigued by Derrida, uh, to account for this last sentence, to show how it picks up motifs generated throughout the essay, how it returns the essay to its beginning, uh, and to consider very carefully its metaphors. It reflects on its own metaphors. Uh, I think you might find intriguing passages. Here there is a sort of question, call it historical, of which we are only glimpsing today the conception, the formation, the gestation, the labor. I employ these words, I admit, with a glance toward the business of childbearing, but also with a glance toward those who, in a company from which I do not exclude myself, turn their eyes away in the face of the as yet unnameable, which is proclaiming itself and which can do so as is necessary whenever a birth is in the offing, only under the species of the non-species in the formless, mute, infant, and terrifying form of monstrosity. All right, well, there's a sentence for you. Uh, and as I say, uh, I don't have time to explicate it, but I commend it to you as a possible paper topic if you're still in need of one. All right, now I do want to go back to the relationship between Derrida and Levi-Strauss. Uh, I suggested last time that while in some ways the essay really seems to stage itself as a critique of Levi-Strauss, at the same time, to a remarkable degree, confessed or unconfessed, it stands on the shoulders of Levi-Strauss. At the same time, however, having made use of Levi-Strauss, finding a means of distancing himself from the source text. Take, for example, page 924 over onto 925, when he, can, when he quotes from Levi-Strauss, uh, the essay, uh, Levi-Strauss's introduction to the work of Marcel Mauss, uh, on the subject of the birth or event or emergence of language. And what he quotes from Levi-Strauss would seem on the face of it to have exactly the same kinds of reservation, hesitation about the emergence or birth of language that Derrida himself has. Levi-Strauss writes, whatever may have been the moment and the circumstances of its appearance in the scale of animal life, language could only have been born in one fell swoop. Things could not have set about signifying progressively. Following a transformation, the study of which is not the concern of the social sciences, but rather of biology and psychology, a crossing over came about from a stage where nothing had a meaning to another where everything possessed it. In other words, bam, all of a sudden you had language. You had a semiotic system, whereas before, yesterday, a minute ago, you had no language at all. In other words, there's no notion that somehow or another suddenly I looked at something and said, oh, that has a meaning. And then, you know, somehow or another I looked at something else and said, oh, that has a meaning. And in the long run, lo and behold, I had language. Because the bringing into existence of the very thought of meaning, Levi-Strauss wants to argue, instantly confers meaning on everything. In other words, you don't have, you don't have a gradual emergence of language. You have, like lava emerging from a volcano, a rupture. You have something which suddenly appears amid other things something which is latent in those things, although they don't in themselves have it until you confer it on them, namely that which confers meaning, language. 
All right, so this is Levi Strauss's argument, and Derrida is interested in it because he recognizes its affinity with his own hesitation in talking about events and births and emergence and so on. But at the same time, at the same time, he points out by way of criticism that to suppose that yesterday there was no language, there was just things as they are without meaning. And that today there is language that things have meaning as a result of their now being in place, that semiotic system we call language. He points out that this means that culture, somehow or another, must come after nature. There was nature. Now there is culture, which is very much like an event or birth in the older sense. In fact, as soon as we have culture, and Levi-Strauss expresses this, this feeling, especially in a famous book called Triftskopik. As soon as we have culture, we begin to feel overwhelming nostalgia for nature. But, says Derrida, what is this nostalgia other than the fact that the very thing we're nostalgic for comes into existence as a result of the nostalgia? In other words, there is no nature unless you have culture to think it. Nature is a meaningless concept, just like the lack of meaning within nature, where there's no culture, until culture comes along and says, oh, not, not so much there is nature, but I'm terribly unhappy because before I came along, there was nature. Right? And this is the nostalgia or regret of the ethnographer who says, now, as a result of this terrible Eurocentrism, as a result of the terrible ethnocentrism of the Europeans studying these things, we no longer have a savage mind. That is to say, we no longer have the kind of mind which flourishes in nature, in a natural environment. You can see ramifications of arguments of this sort for environmentalism as well as for ethnography. Uh, it's a fascinating argument. But the bottom line is this, even this critique, and it is a critique of Levi-Strauss because you know, he's saying, oh, Levi-Strauss, that's very interesting what you say about language, but you've forgotten that this means that you yourself must think nature preceded culture, even though culture brings nature into being. Okay, but this very critique leveled against Levi-Strauss, he could have found in Levi-Strauss and does find it on other occasions. Levi-Strauss's famous book, The Raw and the Cooked, essentially stages this critique in and of itself. What do you mean, raw? Well, you know, somebody's eating in a field, is sitting in a field eating a carrot. That's raw, you say. But wait a minute. You know, what is this notion of raw? You can't have a notion of raw until you have the notion of cooked. You know, I sit in my field, I'm eating my carrot, I, I hold it up and I say, this is raw? It's ridiculous. What raw as opposed to what, right? And so there can be no raw without, in a certain sense, the prior existence of cooked. Cooked brings raw into being in exactly the way culture brings nature into being. Now, to pause over this for a moment, I mean, the, and, and, I mean and we realize that so this basic move, a move that when you start to think about it, we've been encountering ever since we started reading in this course of readings, is not so much the inversion of binaries as the calling into question of how they can exist apart from each other. In other words, this, the, 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 the question of, of criticizing the origin of one state of things out of or after another state of things. The process of criticizing that is basically, and I'm sorry to be so reductive about it, but I really can't see the distortion in saying this, is basically saying which came first, the chicken or the egg, <laughs> right? It is, it, is a, it, it is a declaration of absolute in interdependency among the things that we take that we understand in binary terms, but that we take somehow one to be causative of the other when we think about them. This is really the basic move of deconstruction. But it's a move which anyone who studies philosophy as well as literary theory 
will encounter again and again and again, all the way from Hegel right on through the thinkers, post-deconstructive thinkers we encounter for the rest of our syllabus, uh, uh, perhaps preeminently among them, the gender theorist Judith Butler. Again and again and again, you will encounter this idea. In Butler, it's a question of saying, how on earth would you ever have the concept heterosexual if you didn't have the concept homosexual in place? Right? They are the absolute interdependency of this concept, uh, of these concepts, is again uh, central to her argument and to her understanding of things. And so, and obviously, we'll be returning to that in the long run. Now, I want to pause a little bit more than in this regard over Derrida's distinction between writing and speech. Writing, écriture. Uh, this is a distinction which is not meant sort of counterintuitively to suggest that somehow or another, as opposed to what we usually think, writing precedes speech. Not at all. He's not saying, he's not saying that we've got it backwards. He's just insisting that we cannot understand writing to be derivative. We cannot say writing came into being belatedly with respect to speech in order to reproduce or to imitate or to transcribe speech. Writing and speech are interdependent and interrelated phenomena which do different things. Last time we spoke about difference. We said that the difference between difference with an E and difference with an A can't be voiced. It's a difference, or difference, that comes into being precisely in writing. And it's only in writing that we suddenly grasp the twofold nature of difference as difference and deferral. I'd like to pause a little bit, and this will be my segue to Demand. I'd like to pause a little bit over an interesting example in French, which we don't have in English, but is, I think, so instructive that it's worth pausing over. You remember last time, and there is a slight voicing difference here, just as there's also a slight dif voicing difference, différence, différence, but it's not a big voicing difference. It's not, it's, 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 it's not something that's easier, easy to evoke and get across, whereas in writing, it's perfectly obvious. For one thing, the S, which means signification, <laughs> is dropped out <laughs> of this word when you, say, when, when, when you say A. The word for is, the word for and. Now, these two words precisely express, in French, what Derrida is trying to describe as the double meaning of supplementarity. Is, in the sense of the metaphor, this is that. A is B, understood as a metaphor, is a supplement that, cre that, that completes a whole. It's a means of completing a whole through the declaration that A is B. But is has another sense, in which, which is not a rhetorical sense, that is uh, because metaphor is, is you know, the, sort of the heart of, 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 of rhetoric. The rhetorical sense A is B, when, by the way, we know perfectly well that A is not B. I mean, how can A be B? A is only A. In fact, it's even a question whether A is A, but it's certainly not B, right? So this, th this much we know. But in the, in, in the grammatical sense, there's no sort of mystification about the metaphor. In, in the grammatical sense, this word is the, is the means or principle of predication whereby we say one thing is another thing. The mare is the female of the horse. Notice that the relationship between the rhetorical is and the grammatical is is basically the relationship between ya what Jakobson calls the poetic function and the metalingual function. OK, so and as you'll see in Demand, there is a, 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 an irreducible tension between the rhetorical sense of this word which claims metaphoricity, and the grammatical sense of this word, which makes no such claim, but is simply the establishment of, a, of, the, of, 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 the, of predication in a sentence. Now the word e, which is, which is uh, or e, which is almost like a, reinforces the idea of the supplement 
not as the completion of something that that is th not as the completion of something that needs it to be complete, the fulfillment of meaning and a metaphor, but rather supplement in the sense of adding on to something that's already complete. And the appositional sort of grammatical perpetual addition of meaning in the expression and or a is, after all, very much like what Jakobson calls metonymic, that is to say, the, con the contiguous adding on of things, making no claim to be metaphorical, just like grammatical pre predication. And so the tension or the, the, the system of differences that can be established simply by looking at these two voice similar words, I think gives us a kind of emblem or paradigm for what Derrida calls supplementi supplementarity and what Demand calls the irreducible tension between, difference between, conflict between rhetoric and grammar. And that will be, then that is the main topic of what we have to say about Demand today. Now, last time I said a little bit about the presence of Derrida and Demand together, together with a scholar named J. Hillis Miller, uh, scholars who associated themselves with them, Jeffrey Hartman, Harold Bloom, in a kind of period of flourishing in the 70s and early 80s at Yale, uh, called abroad the Yale School, uh, subject to much admiration in the academy and much vilification, both within and outside the academy. Uh, but a moment of particular uh, and headlined notoriety uh, in the history of academic thinking about literature, a moment in which academic thinking about literature had a peculiar influence on topics much broader than literature, began to infiltrate other disciplines, uh, and was, uh, in general, um, a high-spirited horse for that certain period of time. Now, Shortly after, the, uh, went and, dis and then uh, Miller eventually in the 80s went to Irvine, Derrida followed him there, and in uh, 1983, Paul de Mont died, and the, uh, well, the, the, main, the, the main force uh, of the movement began to give way to other interests and other, uh, and other tendencies and trends, both here at Yale and elsewhere. Um, and then, uh, shortly after Demand's death, there was a revelation which is mentioned by your editor in the italicized preface to Semiology and Rhetoric. There was a revelation about Demand which was horrible in itself, uh, made it impossible ever to read Demand in quite the same way again, but which was also, I have to say, precisely what the enemies of deconstruction were waiting for. Uh, and that was the fact that um, in his youth, uh, Daman still living in Belgium, the son uh, of the, the, the nephew of a distinguished socialist politician in Belgium, uh, wrote for a Nazi-sponsored Belgian newspaper a series of articles, uh, anti-Semitic in tendency, a couple of them openly uh, anti-Semitic anti -Semitic or at least sort of racially Eurocentric in ways that you know, argued for the exclusion of Jews from the intellectual life of Europe and so on. Uh, these papers were, uh, pub were gathered and published as Paul de Mon's wartime journalism, uh, and there was a tremendous furor about them, similar to the revelations about Heide, which had never been completely repressed, but the, the seemed to w grew in magnitude as more and more was known about them, the revolutions about uh, he uh, Heidegger's association with the Nazi government. Uh, and, and, during, and in the late 80s, um, there was uh, a, fu a furious public argumentation back and forth uh, between those both um, who had read Demon and those who hadn't, uh, who uh, were opposed to his work and those who uh, scrambled uh, in one way or another to attempt to defend it, to preserve his legacy and also the legacy of deconstruction. Uh, now, all of this is a matter of record and I suppose needs to be pa paused over a little bit. One of, the, uh, one of the texts of Demand, also in the book called Allegories of Reading, uh, where you'll find also a version of the essay Semiology and Rhetoric that you read for today, 
One of the essays that those who had actually read de Mon actually argued about in a persistent fashion is called The Purloined Ribbon. And it has to do with the passage in Rousseau's Confessions where Rousseau has stolen a ribbon uh, uh, in order to give it to uh, a serving maid to whom he, was he felt attraction. Uh, and then when he was asked uh, uh, who had done it, did he know anything about uh, uh, who had done it, he blurted out her name, Marion. And Dumont says this really wasn't an accusation. In fact, this, 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 was, just, this was just a meaningless word uh, blurted out uh, that, he, that there is no possibility really of confession, that there is, there is no real subjectivity that can affirm or deny guilt or responsibility. In other words, a lot of things that, needless to say, attracted the attention of a public that wasn't perhaps so much concerned that he had written these articles, but that he had never, for the rest of his career, admitted having done so. In other words, that he had suppressed a past. Nobody really believed he still had these sympathies, but the whole question was, uh, why didn't he fess up? Why didn't he come clean? And of course, they took the purloined ri ribbon to be his sort of allegorical way of suggesting that he couldn't possibly confess because nobody can confess. There's no human subjectivity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So as I say, there was a, a considerable controversy, controversy swirling around this article. Uh, and um, it has been very difficult, for just, as, just as is the case with Heidegger, it has been very difficult uh, to read Demand in the same way, again, as a result of what we now know. Let me just, let me just say, though, um, also that and I think this was largely confessed by the people engaged in the controversy, although some people did go farther. There is no cryptically encoded rightism, either in Devon or in deconstruction. There are two possible ways of reacting to what deconstruction calls undecidability, that is to say the impossibility of our really being able to form a grounded opinion about anything. There are two possible ways of reacting to this, one positive and one negative. The negative way is to say that undecidability opens a void in the intellect and in consciousness into which fanaticism and tyranny can rush. In other words, if there is a sort of considered um, and skillfully argued resistance to opinion, call that deconstruction. Then, in the absence of decently grounded, decently argued opinion, you get this void into which fanaticism and tyranny can rush. That's the negative response to undecidability. And it's, of course, something that, uh, that uh, a view that many of us may entertain. The positive voice uh, reaction, however, to undecidability is this. Undecidability is a perpetually vigilant scrutiny of all opinion as such precisely in order to withstand and to resist those most egregious and incorrigible opinions of all, the opinions of fanaticism and tyranny. In other words, you can take two views in effect of skepticism. <laughs> The one that it is, in its insistence on a lack of foundation for, for, for opinion, uh, a kind of, of, of passive acquiescence in whatever rises up in its face. And on the other hand, you can argue that without skepticism, everybody is vulnerable to excessive commitment to opinion, which is precisely the thing that skepticism is supposed to resist. Now. Uh, this isn't the first time in this course that I've paused over uh, a moment at a crossroads where you can't possibly take both paths, uh, but where it is obviously very, very different, difficult to make up one's mind. And it may indeed uh, be a matter more than one can say or care to admit. It may ultimately be a matter of temperament which path one chooses to take.
All right, now in any case, uh, while we're on the subject of deconstruction in general and before we get into demand, let me just say that there is one other way, if I may, not to criticize deconstruction. It's always supposed, popularly, that deconstruction denies the existence of any reality outside a text. Derrida famously, notoriously said, there's nothing outside the text. Right? What he meant by that, of course, is that there's nothing but text. That is to say, uh, the entire tissue and structure and nature of our lives, including history, which we know textually, is all there is. Our lives are textual lives. That's what he meant. He didn't mean to say the text is here and the text contains everything that matters and nothing else exists anyway. What he meant to say is that there is nothing but text in the sense that absolutely everything we ordinarily take to be just our kind of spontaneously lived existence is in fact mediated in the ways we've already discussed at length in this course and we'll discuss more by our knowledge and that our knowledge is textual. Right? That's, that's what he meant. But as I say, it's widely misunderstood. And Daman, uh, in, the, um, in, in the fourth passage on your sheet, um, returns to the attack against this popular supposition and says, in genuine semiology as well as in other linguistically oriented theories, the referential function, and notice the citation of Jakobson here, the referential function of language is not being denied. Far from it. In other words, there's stuff out there. You know, we're, you know we're, we're, it's not a question of, of the idealist who was refuted by Dr. Johnson who kicked a stone and leaped away in terrible pain saying, I refute it thus. Nobody denies the existence of the stone. Right? It's not, it, that, that is not at all the, the, the case. You know, reality is there. Reality is what it is. And the referential function is perpetually in play in language trying to hook on to that reality. The referential function of language is not being denied. Far from it. What is in question is its authority for natural or phenomenal cognition. That is to say, can we know what things are, not that things are, but what things are, using the instrument of language. Daman goes on to say very challengingly, what we call ideology is precisely the confusion of linguistic with natural reality, of reference with phenomenalism. In other words, ideolo ideology is nothing other than the belief that language, my language, what I say and what I think in language, speaks true. That is, that's the position taken up. Not at all the same thing as, to saying, as, as saying what's out there doesn't exist. Nothing to do with that. All right. Now, <clears throat> Demand's early career was influenced primarily, and I'm not speaking of the very early career in which he wrote these articles, but the early career uh, involving the essays which were collect collected in his first uh, book, Blindness and Insight. His early career is mainly influenced by French intellectualism, in particular Jean-Paul Jean Sartre's Being in Time, uh, Being and Nothingness, sorry, and, uh, and the argument of blindness and insight um, is largely uh, to be understood not so much in terms of Demand's later preoccupations with linguistics as with the negotiation of Sartrean existentialism uh, into a kind of literary theory. Uh, and the texts, in particular the text called Criticism and Crisis, the first one that I quote on your sheet, uh, can best be read in those terms. But soon enough, um, Demand did uh, 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 accept and embrace the influence of Saussurean linguistics and structuralism and his vocabulary hence, henceforth took these forms. The vocabulary that we have to wrestle with for today's essay is taken in part from Jakobson's understanding of the relationship between metaphor and metonymy, and we will have, we will have more to say about that. Um, but in the meantime, uh, it's probably on this occasion, once we accept them both as having come under the influence of the same form 
of linguistic thinking uh, to say a little bit about the similarities uh, and differences that exist between Derrida and Deman. Now, similarly, they both take for granted that it is very difficult to think about beginnings, but at the same time, one has to have some way, some proto-structuralist way of understanding that before a certain moment, that is to say, before a, a certain synchronic cross-section, uh, things were different uh, from the way they were in some successive moment. And so, in the second passage on your sheet, to which I'll return in the end, we find Deman saying, literary theory can be said to come into being when. That is Deman's version of the event. Literary theory can be said to come into being when. And he agrees with Derrida uh, in saying, well, sure, you know, God came into being, man came into being, consciousness came into being, that's all very well, but they're just head signifiers in metaphysics. There's something different about language, right? And what both Derrida and Deman say about the difference when one thinks of language coming into being from thinking about all those other things coming into being is that language does not purport to stand outside of itself. It cannot stand outside of itself. It cannot constitute itself. It is perpetually caught up in its own systematic nature. So that it's a center, uh, and we have to resist uh, excessive commitment to this idea of it being a center, but it is at least not a center which somehow stands outside of itself and is a center only in the sense that it is some remote, hidden, impersonal, distant cause. Language is caught up in itself in a way that all of these other moments uh, were not. So, and then also, I think that you can see the similarity to, Der to Derrida in Deman's way insisting, uh, of, of insisting on these binary relations uh, as interdependent and mutual comparable to the sort of thing that I've been talking about in Derrida. Take 891, 92, for example. <coughs> bottom of, very bottom of 890, 891, over to 892. Daman says, it is easy enough to see that the apparent glorification of the critic philosopher in the name of truth is in fact a glorification of the poet as the primary source of this truth. Now, he does not mean, uh, as Freud, for example, met, meant in saying, uh, the poets came before me and the poets knew everything I knew before I knew it. He does not mean that at all. What he means is what he says in the following clauses. If truth is the recognition of the systematic character of a certain kind of error, then it would be fully dependent on the prior existence of this error. In other words, truth arises out of error. Error is not a deviance from truth. Right? Error is not a poetic elaboration on things which somehow, uh, as it does in Plato's view, undermines the integrity of that truth identified by philosophers. On the contrary, philosophy, properly understood, is what comes into being when one has achieved full recognition of a pre-existing error. And that is uh, the, the way in which Deman wants to think about the relationship between, precisely between literature and other forms of speech. And in saying that, I want to move immediately to the differences with Derrida. Derrida, as I said, believes in a kind of seamless web of discourse or discursivity. We are awash in discourse. Yes, we can provisionally or heuristically speak of one form of discourse as opposed to another, literature, law, theology, science, and so on. But it is all easily undermined and demystified as something that has real independent integrity. Deman does not believe this. Deman thinks, on the contrary, that there is such a thing as literariness. He follows Jakobsen much more consistently uh, in this regard than Derrida does. And he says, again and again, he says that 
the, um, that, that uh, the important thing is to insist on the difference between literature and other forms of discourse. He says also, uh, and, and there are all kinds of passages I could, I could elicit in support of this. Let me just quickly read a few, page 883. Page 883, uh, about uh, two-thirds of the way down the left-hand column, he says, uh, where he's talking about the, uh, it's sounding very much like a Russian formalist, talking about the, the, what literature in particular has exclusively that other forms of discourse don't have. He says, literature cannot merely be, conce be, re be received as a definite unit of referential meaning that can be decoded without leaving a residue. The code is unusually conspicuous, complex, and enigmatic. It attracts an inordinate amount of attention to itself, and this attention has to acquire the rigor of a method. The structural moment of concentration on the code for its own sake cannot be avoided, and literature necessarily breeds its own formalism. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip over a few other passages that I was going to read to you in reinforcement of this insistent on, insistence on Demand's part that literature differs from other forms of discourse. The remaining question being, literature differs from other forms of discourse how? Well, it is the disclosure of error <laughs> that other forms of discourse, supposing themselves to refer to things remain unaware of. Literature knows itself to be fictive. Ultimately, we reach the conclusion that if we're to think of literature, we're to think of something that is made up, not something that is based on something, but something that is made up. In the first passage, the statement about language by criticism, that sign and meaning can never coincide, is what is precisely taken for granted in the kind of language we call literary. Literature, unlike everyday language, begins on the far side of this knowledge. It is the only form of knowledge free from the fallacy of unmediated expression. In other words, free from the fallacy that when I say it is raining, I mean I'm a meteorologist and I mean it is raining. Literature when it says it is raining, is not looking out of the window. I mean, you know, this is, this is after all, perfectly true. It, the author may have been looking out of the window, <laughs> but literature, as we encounter it, as a text, is not looking out of the window. How can a text look out of the window? When literature says it is raining, it's got something else, as one might say, in view. All of us, Daman continues, know this although we know it in the misleading way of a wishful assertion of the opposite. Yet the truth emerges in the foreknowledge we possess of the true nature of literature when we refer to it as fiction. And this is why in the last passage on your sheet from the interview with Stefano Rosso, Duman is willing to venture on a categorical distinction between his own work and that of his very close friend, Jacques Derrida. He says, I have a, tend a tendency to put upon texts an inherent, and he means literary texts, I have a tendency to put upon texts an inherent authority, which is stronger, I think, than Derrida is willing to put on them. In a complicated way, I would hold to the statement that the text deconstructs itself. In other words, literature is the perpetual denial of its referentiality. The text deconstructs itself, is self-deconstructed, rather than being deconstructed by a philosophical intervention, that which Jacques Derrida da does. That is to say, J Jacques Derrida bringing his, uh, his sort of delicate sledgehammer <laughs> down on every conceivable form of utterance from the outside, right, rather than being deconstructed by a philosophical intervention from outside the text. So those some remarks then on the differences uh, and the similarities between, uh, between uh, <coughs> Demont and Derrida. Now, semiology and rhetoric. 
historically comes near the end of the period that Structure, Sign, and Play inaugurates. That is to say, it is published uh, in Allegories of Reading. Uh, it is a text uh, which, we can, which, which we can date from the early 1980s. Well, it was published originally as an article, 17, 1979, um, but this is also near the end of a period of flourishing that Derrida's essay uh, inaugurates. Uh, and other things have begun uh, to become crucial. Even before the death of Demand and the revelations about his past, there are a lot of people sort of shaking their fists and saying, what about history? What about reality? You know, I've already suggested that in a variety of ways this is a response that can be naive, but it is still very much in the air. Um, and Deman says, uh, in this atmosphere of response, at the top of page 883, the left-hand column, he says, we speak as if with the problems of literary form resolved once and forever, and with techniques of structural analysis refined to near perfection, we could now move beyond formalism toward the questions that really interest us and reap at last the fruits of the ascetic concentration on techniques that prepared us for this decisive step. Obviously, I think by this time you can realize what he's saying is if we make this move, <laughs> if we move beyond formalism, we have forgotten the cardinal rule of the Russian formalists, namely that there's no distinction between form and content. In other words, that we, in effect, can't move beyond formalism and that it is simply a procedurally mistaken uh, notion that we can. And that's uh, the position, of course, pursued in, in this essay. The task of the essay is to deny the complementarity, the mutual reinforcement, even in rigorous rhetorical analysis like that of Gérard Jeannette, Todorov, Bach, and others, all of whom he says have regressed from the rigor of Jakobsen, to deny that in rhetorical analysis, rhetorical and grammatical aspects of discourse can be considered collusive or continuous or cooperative with each other. Now, I've already suggested the problems ar which, that arise when you consider <coughs> this term even in and of itself, I'm actually uh, ripping off, by the way, an essay uh, about, uh, uh, of Jacques Derrida's called, uh, called, 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 called. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's that essay. And, 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 and now you'll never know my source. Uh, in, in, in any case, uh, the Der Derrida, too, in, in this essay, uh, uh, which is called, <laughs> which is called, uh, is at is at pains to argue that you can't reduce grammar to rhetoric or rhetoric to grammar. Um, and so, as we think about these things, as I suggest, we've already introduced what Demand uh, drives home to us. He says, "Boy, this is complicated theory. Uh, I'm in over my head. So I better just get practical and give you some examples of what I mean." And so he takes up uh, all all in the family. Archie and Edith, what was the name of that show? All in the Family. Uh, and talks about the moment in which Archie becomes <coughs> exasperated uh, when Edith begins to tell him that the difference, the difference between uh, bowling shoes uh, laced over and bowling shoes laced under. This in response to Archie's question, what's the difference? In other words, Archie has asked a rhetorical question. I don't care what the difference is, is the meaning of the rhetorical question. Edith, a reader of sublime simplicity, as Demand says, Edith misinterprets the rhetorical question as a grammatical question. What is the difference? I'm curious to know. And then it proceeds to explain that there's lacing over on the one hand and lacing under on the other hand. Archie, of course, um, can't stand this because um, for him, it's perfectly clear that a rhetorical question is a rhetorical question. Demand's point is, a question is both rhetorical and grammatical, and the one cannot be reduced to the other. Both readings are available. He complicates without changing the argument by then referring to Yeats's poem, Among School Children, 
which culminates, you remember, it has a whole series of metaphors uh, of w attempting, seeming at least to attempt, the synthesis of, 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 of opposites, concluding how can we tell the dancer from the dance? Another question, right? Now, the rhetorical question completes the usual reading of the poem. The answer to the rhetorical question is we can't tell the difference between the dancer and the dance. They are unified in a synthetic, symbolizing, symbolic moment that constitutes the work of art. And so, and all the preceding met metaphors lead up to this triumphant sense of unity, of symbolic unity as the essence of the work of art. A unity which, by the way, entails, among other things, the unity of author and text, right? The unity of agent and production. The unit of all of those things which, uh, as we've seen, much literary theory is interested in collapsing. How can we tell the dancer from the dance? Well, Daman says, wait a minute, though. This is also a grammatical question. And if you stop and think of it as a grammatical question, you say to yourself, gee, that's a very good question, isn't it? Because, of course, you know, the easiest thing in the world is to tell the dancer from the dance. You know, I'm the dancer, and this is the dance I'm doing, <laughs> and, 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 and obviously they're not the same thing, right? I mean, what nonsense poetry speaks, you know? I mean, it's perfectly ridiculous. You know, there, are, there is also a grammatical sense which won't go away just because your rigorous sort of symbolic interpretation insists that it should go away, right? And then Daman, who happens to be a Yeats scholar, his, 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 a, a, he published a dissertation on Yeats and really knows his Yeats, starts adducing examples from all over the canon of Yeats to the effect that, to the effect that um, Yeats is perfectly knowing and self-conscious about these grammatical differences, that there is a measure of irony in the poem that saves it from this sort of symbolizing mystification. And he makes a perfectly plausible argument to the effect that the question is grammatical rather than rhetorical. He's not claiming, and he, and he points this out to us, he's not claiming that his explication is the true one, not his point at all. He's claiming only that it is available and can be adduced from what we call evidence in the same way that the symbolic interpretation based on the rhetorical question is available and can be adduced from evidence. And that these two viewpoints are irreducible. They cannot be reconciled as traditional students of the relationship between rhetoric and grammar in studying uh, the rhetorical and grammatical effects of literature take for granted. That's his argument. He's, it's a kind of infighting because he's talking uh, two people who are actually very close allies. He's saying they're doing great work, but they forget this one little thing. You cannot reconcile rhetoric and grammar. Every sentence is a predication. <laughs> and if every sentence is a predication, it also has the structure of a metaphor. And the metaphor in a sentence and the predication in a sentence are always going to be at odds. A metaphor is what we call a poetic lie. Everybody knows A is not B. A predication, on the other hand, usually goes forward in the service of referentiality. It's a truth claim of some kind. Right? But if rhetoricity and grammaticality coexist in any sentence, the sentence's truth claim and its lie are perpetually at odds with each other. And just taking the sentence as a sentence, irrespective of any kind of inference we might make about intentions. I mean, we know perfectly well what Edith intends and what Archie Bunker intends. It's not as if we're confused about the meaning of what they're saying. It's just that other meanings are available, and since they're not on the same page, those two other meanings coexist painfully and irreducibly at odds, right? But there are cases, suppose Archie Bunker were R.K. Debunker, Suppose Archie Bunker were Jacques Derrida, 
And Jacques Derrida came along and said, what is the difference, right? That would be, that would be an entirely different matter, wouldn't it? Because you would have absolutely I no idea whether the question was rhetorical or grammatical, right? There it wouldn't be, there it wouldn't be possible to invoke an intention. Because the whole complication of Derrida is precisely to raise the question about not knowing, not being able to voice the difference between difference and difference, and, uh, and, and not knowing whether Archie is right or whether Edith is right. Proust, I don't have time for, but I will, but, but, it's, but it's a marvelous reading of, of, a, of a, the, that wonderful passage uh, in which um, it, remember that he's set it up at the beginning of the essay with a, with a kind of wonderful, cunning sort of sense of structure by talking about the grandmother in Proust who's always driving Marcel out into the garden because he can't stand the interiority of his reading. Well, then later on in the essay, Demand quotes this wonderful passage in which Marcel talks about the way in which he brought the inside, brought the outside inside as he was perpetually conscious of everything that was going on out there during the process of his reading so that ultimately in the charmed moment of his reading there was no difference between inside and outside. In other words, a metaphor, a metaphor, uh, a rhetorical understanding of the relationship between inside and outside has been accomplished. But then grammatical analysis shows that the whole structure of the passage is additive, that is, 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 put, is adding things on, is complicating and reinforcing an argument without insisting on, the, on, on identity, on the underlying uh, identity on which metaphor depends. And so he calls this metonymic. By the way, I'm going to leave also to your, to your sections the strange confusion that ensues on taking, uh, uh, in taking a rhetorical device, metonymy, and making it synonymous with grammar on the axis of combination. I leave that to your sections. But in the meantime, he says, no, 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 then. I guess this passage isn't rhetorical. After all, it must be metonymic. But wait, it is spoken by a voice. There is this wonderful, overarching voice that unifies everything after all. This is what I call, says Demand, the rhetoricization of grammar. Right? But wait, but wait. That voice is not the author. That voice is a speaker. That voice is Marcel, uh, you know, performing his wonderful uh, sort of metaphoric magic. Uh, but we know that the author is painstakingly putting this together in the most labor laborious kind of composed way, uh, making something up in, a, in an additive way that's not rhetorical at all, it's grammatical. This is a supreme writer putting together long sentences. And so, wait a minute, it must be, after all, the grammaticization of <laughs> rhetoric, the whole point of which is that the worm of interpretation keeps turning. All right? It doesn't arbitrarily stop anywhere because rhetoric and grammar remain irreducible. We have to keep thinking of them as being uncooperative with each other. Okay, have to stop there. Might add a word or two. But on Thursday, we turn, I'm afraid, with a certain awkwardness. I wish there were a w an intervening weekend to Freud and Peter Brooks. <laughs> but in the meantime, <laughs> we'll see you then.